Well, hey there, this is Carol again, uh, Keto Carol, for those of you that know me that way, and I'm the creator of the Fast Track Keto Success Program. I am here today, I'm very honored and privileged to be chatting with Miriam Kalamian, and so she is a nutrition educator and consultant specializing in a ketogenic diet for cancer, so it's really important information that she's going to share with us today. In her work with hundreds of people, she has specialized uh, I'm sorry, she has personally witnessed the life-changing effects of this powerful diet therapy. Uh, Miriam is well-credentialed. She has a master's of science in, or ma I'm sorry, master's of education. I'm just bumbling this all up, so bear with me, everyone. Uh, she's a master's in education. She has a master's of science in human nutrition, and she is a certified nutrition specialist. And I'm so excited to have you. Welcome, Miriam. Hello, Carol. I'm glad to be here today. Great, wonderful. And so, Miriam, will you just tell us, you know, who, who are you? How do you define yourself? Define myself? Well, uh, it, well it's been different things at different times, but yeah. uh, for the last decade, I'd, I'd say I, I've been a mom and, um, and a keto specialist. There's very few of us out there. Growing yeah. numbers, as I see, but, you know, the focus has been in... Um, um, it, 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 there's sort of like two different arms. There's the medical arm that looks at this as a medical intervention, like an epilepsy, and uh, you know, and looking at ways of using this for like neurodegenerative disease. And yeah. then there's the other arm that's been focused on, like I would call them the diseases of insulin resistance. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and and that's you know that's where consumer driven. That's where people who haven't been able to uh, deal with those issues in another way are, you know, finding people like you that can guide them through this. And that's, you know, that's where it's going to be. It's not going to come from conventional medicine just yet. It will happen, but not right now. Yeah, yeah. So um, will you please share with everyone your story? How did you get on this keto journey? How did you get become so passionate and knowledgeable um, about, about this subject, especially for cancer? Oh, it's a very personal journey. Uh, in 2004, my son, who was only four years old at the time, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And you can imagine that's just devastating for a parent to get that kind of a diagnosis. And, uh, and you know, we didn't know anything. And in 2004, the only information on the internet was uh, basically unreadable in that uh, it was, there was just nothing positive about it. And, uh, and there was nothing for us to do, we thought, than just go along with the program. It was like the best thing. They called it the gold standard protocol. And so we put our son through 14 months of weekly chemotherapy. It's weekly chemotherapy. And um, it didn't stop the tumor. So it, you know, with at his first post-treatment MRI, the tumor was, as they said, lit up like a Christmas tree and ready to make a run for it. So then, you know, there was lots of decisions, and I won't go into that. People can read a little more of the story on my website. I have a click through to Rafi's story. And, uh, and so, you know, we did a bunch of damaging therapies, um, and nothing was stopping the tumor, uh, slowing it down maybe a little bit, but not stopping it. So at two and a half years, all of a sudden, you know, it's like, okay, we've done this, we've done that, we've been in this clinical trial, and we failed the clinical trial. And it was like, okay, then what? And it's like, well, you know, palliative care. It's like, we weren't, so we we're blown away. We're not ready to hear that right now. You know, that just kind of took us by surprise that there wasn't anything else. So I write to a bunch of people on the brain tumor consortium. I write to 12 people, the little paragraph that should be able to, you know, to get some information back from them. So these are like the top docs in the country. And I send them the same paragraph, 12 people. I get seven responses, that's all, just seven, so five of them didn't even bother. And out of the seven responses, there were only two that were for the same, you know, looking at the same thing. And the, the other six ranged from, as I'm just blown away still to say this, because they talk about consensus. Well, there was no consensus. It went from uh, let them go, mm. just let them go, to the most aggressive therapies that were uh, available to him, which was uh, very risky surgeries. So, um, so we did go with the risky surgeries, a couple of them, uh, and that slowed it, but didn't stop it. And in particularly in one area, the tumor had grown back 25% in just 
you know, in a short period of time. Wow. Um, so I guess I kind of backtracked there a little bit, but kind of moving forward when, when he was uh, at that point, when we were at that point of failing the clinical trial, um, I, I, uh, I was looking up a drug that he, it's kind of hard to get through, I'm sorry. I was looking up a drug that he um, was on and um, for the side effects of it, because I hadn't been adequately prepared for what the side effects were, and uh, found something I wanted to print out. And the printer wasn't working because it was at my 80-something-year-old mother's house and she never used it. So yeah. uh, a few days later, I go back to that same website to print that information out, and it's not there. Instead, there's a study, because this is Science Daily, so it changes daily. And the study was Dr. Thomas Seyfried's mm. um, the restricted ketogenic diet as a, as a uh, potential treatment for uh, glioma. Wow, and so the serendipity, it, serendipity uh, of the, the printer not working. That you uh -huh. have if the printer had worked that day, I yeah. wouldn't be standing here talking to you yeah. because there's no way I would have gone down the nutrition road. But so we find this, we we do what we can. You know, Dr. Seafried sent me a few papers, including one with two pediatric brain tumor patients that had started it all in the 90s. And the Charlie Foundation was around at that time, and um, they were supporting uh, epilepsy, but not, uh, not the diet for cancer, but there was an interest in it. Um, so I did get some information. I did get some parent support off of that group, and we started Rafi on, on the diet, like, immediately. And um, so he had his MRI that uh, showed that the tumor was still growing. They kicked him off the clinical trial, and then... Um, Three months later, we had another MRI with diet uh, and a failed, a low dose of a failed chemo drug that he had taken previously and hadn't worked for him. But the oncologist had to have something because um, they can't just treat with diet, right? <laughs> so uh, anyway, in three months, his tumor had shrunk 10 to 15%. And that was unbelievable to us. So we sent the MRI to a couple of different places and they concurred that his tumor had stopped growing and had shrunk back. So... Uh, I still didn't know what I was doing, and I knew that a lot of it was probably wrong. And I got uh, Beth from the Charlie Foundation to sit with me for an hour and a half and literally begged her to do it. Um, and she straightened me out on the things that were wrong. And that, it was at that point, though, that I decided that if we were going to do this, that I had to know a lot more than I did. So that uh, Rafi's MRI was at the end of June. My discussion with Beth was mid-July, and by, uh, by middle, late August, I was enrolled in the graduate program. And my focus the whole time, even though it was a very traditional program for registered dietitians, my focus was, okay, I'm going to get everything I can, ketogenic diet. So that's, that's what I did. And, where did, you, uh, so where did you go to school? Eastern Michigan. Eastern okay. Michigan University. They have a master's program for, um, for registered dietitians. Um, but I, with taking a bunch of pre, you know, I had to make up a bunch of prerequisites um, to the course, but I did all of it. And I was really totally just threw myself into it. Rafi was doing so good at that time from the diet and he was back in school and I, um, and I just went for it. And yeah. I, you know, I learned a lot, um, but boy, there wasn't as much to learn then. Mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. Is right now. So yeah, so it was August of 2007 that I started the program. So what was it like to be in school with you? Were you, were you so passionate about this telling everyone or were you a little more reserved and... and oh, no, no, I told everyone. <laughs> uh, and every chance I had, every project, every individual thing, it would be on ketogenic, ketogenic. And I, you know, I had actually, there was one gal with such pushback, one of my peers, yeah. and there was such pushback. Uh, she told me I should just let nature take its course. Oh, my so, gosh. So this is like, I got wonderful support from a couple of people and wonderful support from the graduate level professors. Wow. But the, even the undergraduate instructors for the prereq courses were very against me bringing this stuff up. And every time I took, uh, and you, pro you didn't have to go through this, I would bet, but uh, every time I took a quiz or an exam, there'd be this question in there that would say, you know, like true or false, that glucose is the primary fuel, or sometimes it would say the only fuel for the brain and central nervous system. And I'd have to say yes. And right there, you know, there's this little guy in my life who was obviously not running on glucose. 
And so in school, you were completely passionate about the ketogenic diet, and it was a struggle for you in, you know, having to reconcile what you were being taught, the standard approach to nutrition, how glucose and carbohydrates were essential for life and health and energy, and what you knew to be true with all the research that you'd been doing on your own. And right. You were talking about how on a test that was so hard to answer the way you, you knew you had to answer to get the right answer, but it really wasn't the right answer. Right. And I see even now, like in the most recent version of uh, edition of the textbook that we used, which was like the, the gold standard textbook, it still got it wrong as, yeah. as far as ketogenesis goes. There's still uh, wrong things. As a matter of fact, I'm writing a chapter for a book um, and it's an integrative um, um, medicine book. And I'm doing the chapter on, on ketosis and, and uh, ketogenesis and all that. So that's, that's pretty exciting to be able to get some information out there that's going to be vetted and, uh, and of use for people. Now, other, you know, I'm still like casting around trying to find bits and pieces for my references. I have the research uh, papers, but as far as using text references that people can go to, it's hard. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I remember, you know, I got my master's between uh, 2009 and 2012. And even then, um, you know, there was a brief mention of a ketogenic diet for treating epilepsy. We didn't learn anything about it. And I do remember that they said like the, you know, of the three macros, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, that carbohydrates were the only one that was non-essential for life. Right. And See, yeah, I remember that. having a discussion with other classmates where they'd say something. And this again was before I even know, knew really anything about a ketogenic diet, except for it was something to treat epilepsy. And, and I remember, you know, saying that once to one of my classmates about, yeah, you know, carbs are not essential. And she's like, that's not true. That's oh, yeah. not true at all. It's like, we just learned that in lecture. Like, uh, but it was still, it's, you know, and, and you're running up against that with, you know, people who believe something to be true for so long, right. despite mountains of evidence, they still want to hold on to something they believe to be true for 30 years. And it That's takes it. a lot to change what's being taught. Right. We're holding on to an opinion that was developed and put out there at one point, but it was just an opinion. It wasn't based on scientific fact. And there are, have been people all along that have known that we don't, that carbohydrates are not essential. Dietary intake of carbohydrates are not essential. And I think part of the problem comes from, yes, we do need glucose. It's not that, like even cutting down glucose to zero intake, you're still, your body's going to take over and make the glucose it needs because your red blood cells need it. And there's other tissue that needs it. And there's 25% of your brain tissue that's never going to adapt to, um, to ketones. It's not, it's not set up that way. So, you know, you, you do have energy needs that need to be met through glucose, but it doesn't have to be half your diet. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. That's the part that's missing for people is that, yeah, we need glucose, but guess what? Our body can make it just fine on its own. We don't have to eat carbs to get that glucose. So that's, that's the part that you and I understand, but it's missing from a lot of people's understanding of, um, I, I, you know, it's a tough concept because, because of what, how we are raised, but also just because, you know, we think of people, people don't get the fine differences between sugar. Like they'll say sugar, their blood sugar. They're yeah. really talking about their blood glucose. They're talking about one monosaccharide. They're not talking about the whole range. But so that kind of, that confusion um, that I see with people is understandable because they're not biochemists. They haven't studied this. Yeah. Uh, I remember teaching a class after, you know, after I'd graduated, I was teaching nutrition classes at a school in Portland. And I remember, um, you know, presenting, you know, the kind of diet, diet for weight loss history. And I pulled up, um, you know, I found this blog about this family that was doing a zero carb approach. And I was, you know, pretty much I was making fun of it as like, there's no way that they could eat that way and be um, healthy. And all the things they were saying about having plenty of energy, I was like, that's, that can't be true. I'm sure they're just so lethargic all the time. They have no energy. And, and I knew, I mean, here I have a master's degree in nutrition, and I didn't even understand that the body had all these alternate ways of, of having plenty of energy. And then, you know, had it not been for the... the and yet, it makes such perfect sense because, you know, 100,000 years ago, you didn't have a refrigerator or a cupboard. And, you know, if you were a little short of food, you still had to go out and either find it or hunt it. Right. And if you were lethargic, or if your brain wasn't able to use another source of energy other than glucose, you, you know, you were going to die in a few days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So it's just crazy to think that 
uh, where we're at with with our thinking on that. When when yeah. you look at, at you know compare our daily lives to 100,000 years ago and all those gaps in the food supply, if we hadn't been able to adapt to them, we wouldn't be around as a species. Yeah, yeah, so true. Yeah, I've I've learned so, such. You know, I have to say a lot of what I teach now is probably 180 degree different than what I was. Oh, and I came right out of my program. It was like, okay, I wasn't even out of the program and I was already helping people with yeah. starting the diet as best as I knew how to do it then. Yeah, yeah. Well, Miriam, it's obvious where your passion came from uh, in, in keto for cancer. Do you, can, uh, can you um, tell us the, the heartbreaking, uh, you know, conclusion of what, what you know your your son did live a very much longer than was expected but um he lived an additional six years so it was eight and a half years since the diagnosis wow he was 13 when he died and we know now that his tumor had been with him most likely even prenatally it was just oh, wow. uh, so big and it was so uh, diffuse and it was so um uh, just infiltrated into the margin of his normal brain tissue that it, um, he just didn't, there was nothing at the time. And I don't believe there's still anything. I think we could have, he would have lived longer yeah. if we had been on top of this with a diet from the beginning. I think we could have um, seen that shrinking in the first uh, few months of therapy. I think uh, it, that would have been a big help for a very hypoxic huge size of an orange in a four-year-old's head, Carol. Wow. So, wow. Um, yeah. So he was on the diet for three years. And, and for the first couple of years, we were really, really tight with everything, weighed and measured everything. And then realized in the, um, in the final year that he was on it, that uh, we didn't really, you know, that we had a handle on it and we didn't have to be that rigorous in terms of um, recording everything that we really, we could go by what we saw with his blood numbers instead. Mm -hmm. um, blood numbers in urine ketones, uh, because I know this whole thing, there's controversy about using urine ketones. Um, but, uh, you know, I see for people with cancer, they're still very viable, uh, long after the first few weeks. Okay. With kids, they're always viable. Kids have a very different metabolism. So it's always a good check on, um, on what their ketones are. So we did that. And then, um, and then he had an uh, episode is probably, they, they never did figure it out, but it was a uh, uh, restricted, we think it was restricted blood flow to the brain because the tumor mm. was wrapped around the, um, the artery that feeds the brain. And, uh, and he did a, a sort of a downhill spiral that went on for about 10 months. Uh, and then there was a very quick reversal, just a, a that's a whole story in itself. Oh. Um, a quick reversal and we had him with us in perfect working order for another full year after that mm -hmm. went to mexico we went camping for five months in mexico we had a great time wow um and then uh he started another spiral down and that's the one he didn't recover from so that it's going to be four years in just a few weeks that he's oh Mir miriam as a as a mom myself my heart goes out to you for what you've been through like i i don't think there's anything uh harder to endure than than uh the death of your own child so i just I, my heart goes out to you and i'm i'm so glad that you're here to actually um you know to share your experience with people and um to that's be why i do it it's a way yeah. of honoring my little guy yeah yeah ah uh, um, yeah, I'm so, thank you so much for being able to share that with us. And, and I, I can't even imagine what it's been like for you. So, um, sending lots of love and, and support and, and thank you so much for, for the work that you're doing. Cause it's really important. And like you said, even as much as you've de delved into this, there's so much that we have yet to learn and it's a really, that's the key we have yet to learn. And so it's like, uh, I would have done, of course, knowing what I know now, I would have done things differently from day one, or even from when we finally did discover the diet. Um, but the game changer is what's what we're learning now. And in the next, you know, what, two years, five years, 10 years, what we're going to know then yeah. is going to really turn this around. Uh, it, the research is active. It's not the ketogenic diet for cancer is not going away. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, it's not going to be uh, universally accepted by oncology for all kinds of reasons that we yeah. don't have the time to go into. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, I mean, there's just basically there's, there's no money in it. So there's no support for the, the trials. Uh, and it's only very passionate people 
that pull yeah. together their limited resources to even run a trial. And there are some passionate people out there doing this, you know, in Egypt and uh, in Turkey. Here in the U.S., there's a few centers that have uh, tried to run trials. But, um, you know, the bottom line is you don't need a clinical trial in order to do this diet. You could just, yeah. when your doctor says diet doesn't matter, eat what you want, then, yeah. okay, that's to me, that's like, he just gave you or she just gave you permission to eat the way you want. Right. So why not eat ketogenic? Why not give yourself that opportunity? You know, if you if two months from now or three months from now it's not working for you, you know, then you make another choice. But I I don't see it not working for people very yeah. often. I just I got two very heartwarming emails just in the last twenty four hours, and one of them is a little guy with a very serious brain tumor, and um, it is not growing despite the fact that his parents have opted out of conventional care, which I'm not saying you need to do. Yeah. But that's what his parents' decision was and I'm just helping with the diet. Yeah. Uh, and then another one from a woman who told she was told she wasn't even going to be able to see her son graduate from college, which is next month. Wow. And she wrote today and said, hello, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still here. That's so great. The doctors are now curious about the diet that I'm on. It's like, yes. Oh, that's yes. fantastic. That's, that's wonderful. And you know, from several people that I've listened to, you know, lecture about, you know, how are we going to get this shift that, you know, diet is looked at for effective therapies for so much stuff. And it ends up being, it's really hard to change, you know, top down approach to government recommendations, the primary healthcare providers. And so it ends up being the most powerful way is, you know, helping people that are dealing with this on their own. And then they, they ah, end up having the influence on. Uh, look how powerful social media has been in the politics of our nation. Yeah. And we can be, uh, begin to understand how, how, powerful a tool it can be in something like this where people read about the successes of others not just as like testimonials on somebody's website right. but I mean they're reading about real people and the effect that this is having and then they're going out and trying this and and it's like I promote it as an adjunct I don't think ketogenic diet except in what is clearly watch and weight cancers I don't think ketogenic diet is going to cure anybody. I know there's people out there saying that, yeah. but I can't say that from my own experience or even from the hundreds of people that I've worked with. I don't see it as a cure, but I see it as a great adjunct, whether they're going uh, the, uh, the, you know, the conventional care route because they're too afraid to, you know, to consider any other options. I'll support them there with diet and they're getting awesome responses to their treatment. Yeah. And then, but if people are opting out of conventional care for whatever reason, you know, in the oncology world, a lot of times, especially older adults, they don't go for the chemotherapy or they don't go for the radiation because it's going to destroy their quality of life. And they're told they're going to be dead in a year anyway. So or dead in six months anyway. So why do, why do they want to do that? So instead they're like this woman that wrote to me today, um, she was told she probably had three months and yeah, three months. I think that was a scare tactic on her doctor's part. Mm -hmm. I don't think looking at her stuff, I don't think that she, I think she had like a six month window there. Um, but here she's out from that and doing great, still feeling good and working hard and enjoying life and looking forward to her son's graduation. I remember, a, you know, about a year ago, a friend of mine that knew I was doing a ketogenic diet shared some article that was written on, you know, whatever website that featured the work of uh, Dr. Seafried and, you know, talking about a ketogenic diet used for cancer and um, the backlash. So she posted it and she tagged me like, what do you think about this? And, and I, I know better than to get into social media arguments, right? Because right. people have a strong opinion. There's nothing I can ever say to them or post or anything that will ever um, change their mind. And they're going to dig in even further, no matter what I say. So I just, I hold back. I don't say anything. And so this, there was one of her friends that then commented, she said she's an oncology nurse. And she said that that was, you know, first she attacked Dr. Seafried and then the website that this was posted on. And then she said this was dangerous to give people this kind of hope and to even promote this as a way that, you know, could help them. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, it was, heart, it was heartbreaking to hear that this woman was so passionate about don't tell anybody about this therapy at all. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Okay. You know, one of the things that was said uh, in, uh, in opposition to the diet, I have a whole presentation on uh, diet uh, skeptics and saboteurs. As a matter of fact, uh, this is a great website. So if you could post this for your, for your um, 
your audience, and yeah. that's metabolic therapeutics. Um, and they, uh, that's Dr. Dominic D'Agostino's team at the University okay. of South Florida, and they've hosted now two uh, conferences in Tampa in February. And the, uh, the videos and are up from the 2016 conference and the 2017 conference, which includes you know, a lot of top people in cancer, Adrian Sheck and Dr. Um, Dr. C. Fried and uh, uh, Dr. Colin Champ. Um, it, so it, Angela Poff, uh, so, and then a bunch of people like, you know, like me and, uh, and Andrew Scarborough and, you know, talking about our experiences personally with the diet too. Anyway, I did uh, diet uh, uh, skeptics and saboteurs and that it uh, will be posted as a video, probably not until next month or maybe even June. Okay. But go to the site and bookmark it and keep checking back. And in the meantime, yeah. people could watch the 2016 presentations. They're just, you know, they're really good. It's a really solid group of people. And yeah. it's all passion yeah. about the diet for, for various applications. And boy, we're finding, you know, even autism, there's, a, mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's, there's room for it in the autism world. And if you can turn around, if you can protect that young child's developing mind, uh, and, you know, just keep kicking that can down the road and keep protecting that brain. You know, I think there'll, there'll be other options for autism down the road, too. But you got to protect the brain now. It's got to happen yeah. now. And that's the thing about cancer. We can't wait for 10 years for this, to, you know, to be. And, and even if uh, even if even when it is verified, like it was for epilepsy, there are still neurologists who tell the parents that say, what about ketogenic diet? They'll say, oh, it's too hard. Or, oh no, that won't work for you. And it's like, we were told it was too, too hard by my son's endocrinologist. It's yeah. like, too hard? No, too hard was sitting in the, in, the, in the waiting room, you know, through these surgeries, not knowing if we were going to get a kid out at the yeah. end. Or was yeah. he alive at the end of the day? Yeah. And that's too hard. Doing the diet? That's a piece, I won't say a piece of cake. That's <laughs> A, a piece of steak. <laughs> a piece of steak. <laughs> yeah. A walk in the park is what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and you're sharing a story with me too. And let's go back to school. And one of the projects that you had at school was, um, you know, obesity in kids. And so can you walk us through like this, this uh, it was yeah. a project, it wasn't research, right? Or was it both? Or uh, Well, after part of my certification, so I'd already graduated. Okay. And, uh, and actually towards the end of that time, I started the internship. Uh, and there's a, a, you know, I live in a pretty um, rural area in Western Montana. And um, my son's pediatrician had founded a uh, nonprofit um, service for children and family. And uh, one of the projects that he wanted to take on was um, looking at um, obesity, kids at risk of obesity uh, at an early age. And if we could do an intervention program and he, uh, so for my internship, uh, to qualify for sitting for the um, exam that I took from the Board for Certification and Nutrition Specialist, 1,000-hour internship. So this is what I chose. I took on this project, and I developed this project. Um, and, you know, originally, uh, we were looking at, like, seven-year-olds, but we ended up taking in five-year-olds even in this. There were five-year-olds who were already uh, not just at risk of obesity. These kids were all greater than the 99th percentile. And then uh, they ranged from the five-year-olds. I think the oldest kid we had in the program might have been 15, a couple of 15-year-olds. Um, and, and so I started with, okay, so we had three components. We had a, um, uh, you know, the diet component, and we had a uh, family coach um, because it's a family problem when kids yeah. are obese at that age. And then um, we also had a fitness component to it to get kids moving. Um, and so my part for the, uh, you know, for the nutrition part was I followed my plate and I had the little checklist and I had the, you know, and I met with the families. And so after 10 weeks of this, it was like, we'd gotten nowhere with it. So I went to, you know, my pediatrician friend and said, uh, you know, I would really like to try a, a modified version of what we've done for Rafi. There's something called the modified Atkins. And then I'd like to try that with these kids. And and I know it's not going to harm them. And we're only looking at 10 weeks. And let's see if we can get some better results. And we did. And then it was great. Like shortly after that, uh, David Ludwig, uh, uh, I think he was at Boston Children's, Boston Children's probably. And he came out with 
you know, low carbohydrate diet is really the best plan for kids, you know, uh, overweight and obese, you know, children and teenagers. Um, and uh, so anyway, we verified it, but unfortunately, program's over. And, you know, okay, I had a support group that was running after that, but they sort of petered out after the first yeah. few weeks. And then I'd see these kids in the community and they had regained their weight. So, uh, you know, we need not just the programs and the right plan and the food lists and all of that. We need a supportive environment. Yeah. We just don't have a supportive environment. I, my feeling was if those parents had gone home and really cleaned all that stuff out of the cupboards and out of the fridge, you know, so the kids would get some of that stuff at school, but they wouldn't have it on hand yeah. every day. Uh, and they would have been uh, modeling a different uh, way of eating that would have been healthy for the whole family. And that's my feeling is like, yeah, everybody should, you know, should be cutting out, uh, you know, who needs this stuff? Who needs the yeah. sugar? Be careful, yeah, don't I mean, be covered, I, even if you do nothing else, but take soybean oil out of your cupboards and throw it away. Nobody <laughs> needs to eat this stuff. So I, I want to, you know, I got a couple other questions and then we'll, we'll try to wrap it up. so we don't keep uh, having these, having these challenges. So, well, and may, maybe it's done with me turning that off and turning okay. it back on. We'll see. Yeah. Um, so what types of cancers respond best to ketogenic diet and, um, you know, do all types um, or are certain types more responsive? Well, that's a diet. great question. And boy, I wish I had the answer. Uh, some people think that if a tumor is a cancer, isn't glucose avid. In other words, if it doesn't uh, show up on a scan, that it's that this diet's not going to be effective. But that is a, a too simplified a way of looking at things because um, it's not just about starving your cancer of glucose. What you're doing with this diet is you're shutting down the cancer promoting pathways mm. um, and you're, uh, and those are, uh, you know, I don't want to get too technical, but there's things like mTOR, which is an anabolic pathway. Yeah. Uh, cancer just thrives with upregulated mTOR. Then there's one called IGF-1, insulin like growth factor one that is upregulated in cancer. Um, and insulin and IGF-1 are related to one another. And so insulin receptors, you know, there's more insulin receptors, there's more gluc glucose receptors, uh, but less availability, less fermentation. It's the fermentation of the glucose. It's gonna get some glucose if it's cancer. Yeah. It's gonna ferment it in the cytoplasm of the cell. Then it's gonna push that acid that it makes out into the microenvironment of the cell, and that causes inflammation and disease progression. So even if your cancer isn't like lighting up like a Christmas tree on a scan, mm. it's going to respond to these changes in its nutrient supply, and it's going to respond in kind of like the way that we're built of evolutionary, you know, uh, to uh, respond which is, uh-oh, better shut down any superfluous activity that's going on. We don't want these cells that proliferate real fast. You know, we, don't, we can't support them right now because we're not getting the nutrients. It's just a perception that it's not getting, you know, the nutrient, you know, the cells aren't getting the nutrients because actually they are getting what they need. Yeah. They're just not getting the glucose that's going to support that kind of accelerated activity in the cytoplasm. So... Um, so, you know, when I, uh, uh, I want to make it clear that I think brain cancer is one primary, primary target for this, mm -hmm. and not just because of my own experience, but because it has such a poor prognosis to start with, that uh, it, the effects of it are much clearer. It's, uh, you know, you see what's happening, and that shouldn't be happening with, with the protocol that you're on. You know, I have one woman that I've worked with for six years, you know, six years that's a that's unheard of in in glioblastoma yeah um but other cancers like newly diagnosed breast cancer not so clear what the benefit is going to be because that's one that uh you know some women once they're treated they never have another sure they still got cancer cells in there but they it never rears its ugly head again and then in other women they're shocked to find out that six seven eight years out from their original diagnosis now they have metastatic disease mm -hmm. which is much less treatable but again you know you go to the doctor you find out you have metastatic disease they they give you the you know the dire prognosis um and you know people should have hope you know there's always a certain percentage of people 
that are not going to fall prey to the disease in that, that they're not going to respond to that expiration date. They're going to keep living. Yeah. So, um, so why shouldn't, you know, what I tell people is why shouldn't you believe that you're in that group of people that may have that kind of a response? Because what's the point in, in thinking otherwise? And that was, a, you know, something that, um, a, that I, Oh, that I read that I thought was just horrible was the guy saying one of his objections to the ketogenic diet or was that um, it kept you from getting your affairs in order. <laughs> I was like, I have never seen a case where it kept somebody from getting their affairs in order. Right, because right. when your brain is functioning and you're feeling better, you're much able to start thinking about, well, you know, what, what do I really need to do? You know, yeah. what do I want to do and what do I need to do? And, and, and then you find yourself like this woman I was telling you about making plans to go to graduation. So, uh, yeah. I, you know, um, why shouldn't people have some hope there? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and you know, from the psychological side of it, we, we know the power of positive thinking. Like there definitely is a, a positive impact on people's health and survival rates when, when they have hope and when they have you know, a positive outlook. And if their stress levels are lower, if their sleep is better, if they're looking at the toxins that are in their environment, if they're making those kinds of changes, instead of just sitting around helpless and hopeless, then, you know, that is going to improve quality of life. So at the very least, you're going to be improving your quality of life, um, and hopefully prolonging your life and maybe just seeing that disease go away. Uh, you know, the, the, the goal for aggressive Late stage cancers is just long term management, but the goal for early cancers, um, less aggressive cancers, is wipe them out. Yeah, yeah. So, what what are some of the primary differences between uh, a ketogenic diet for cancer versus, you know, let's just say, uh, you know, most of the people out there jumping on the keto bandwagon just want to use it for weight loss. Right. So what, what would you say are some of the, you know, the big differences between, you know, somebody just reads this blog yeah. out there, like, here's how I lost weight on keto. They've got, fi they find they've got cancer and they just go, oh, I'll just follow this approach. What are, what are the things that, that are the biggest differences? The biggest difference is, uh, it's been clear since Atkins days what the biggest difference is. And that is that, um, okay, everybody gets a handle on what it means to lower carbs. It's not, that's not a big challenge in my world to get people to understand carbs. And maybe it takes some looking at a food record to see that the sunflower um, butter that they're using has maple syrup in it. You know, it's like those things, but you get by that early on. Uh, the next hurdle is uh, the protein target. Most people are eating about twice the amount of protein that they really need. Yeah. And protein is what keeps that mTOR pathway active. Yeah. So, uh, so it's very important in a ketogenic diet for cancer to make sure that you set a realistic protein target. Of course, if you're in a, in therapy, uh, a catabolic therapy, in other words, one that's breaking down and, you know, you're going to need some extra protein to, you know, to rebuild tissue. Um, but if you're out from that, um, it, you don't need a whole lot. And in brain cancer, you don't have that catabolic state, you know, system wide and, you know, real tight management of protein. And then the other thing with like with Atkins or a weight loss ketogenic diet is people very rarely eat the amount of fat to, you know, that's going to, they've gotten rid of over half their calories from carbs, but they're not now taking in all of those extra calories, either through protein or fat. So they're losing weight. Um, but in a, uh, in a ketogenic diet for cancer, um, I want that weight loss to be um, impactful in the first couple of months. I want it to make a real big impression on the cancer in the first couple of months. But in order for this to be sustainable, you, you got to slow that down after that and, uh, and, and just um, use other, there's other strategies like intermittent fasting. You can narrow that eating window down. And so you've got, you know, if you can get 14 or 16 hours on a daily basis that, uh, that you're not eating by finishing dinner early, not eating after dinner, get up in the morning, maybe have a couple bulletproof coffee and, you know, zoom till 10, 11, 12 o'clock, you're going to have that daily intermittent fasting. And that is also um, a technique for shutting down that mTOR pathway for lowering the, uh, the insulin, you know, so, you know, there's a couple of different routes to get at this. And you can play around with that. I don't, I don't support the whole cyclic, di uh, uh, cyclic uh, ketogenic diet. 
Um, oh, yeah, for cancer, that's got to be terrible. <laughs> no, uh, I, I think it... Uh, well, let's set the stage so some people haven't even heard the cyclic Cato. What's this? Oh. Like, what? Tell, just give everybody a basic... Uh, I, I well, it, the base, there's, there's so many different variations out there. And uh, like in the, in the uh, performance world, athletic performance, it's coming off it for coming off the ketogenic diet for a, a period of time and basically carb loading. Yeah. Um, uh, it, you know, it doesn't, it, it just, there's all kinds of, like I said, there's all kinds of variations. Um, and then there's in the metabolic world, it's like bringing people up to, you know, 60 or up to 80 or up to hundred grams of carb a day for a period of time and then bringing them back down. Um, but I think if you're going to do that, you can't do that on your own. You have to be working with somebody that it, because the danger in that is basically falling off the keto wagon. Yeah. I, I find for the ladies that I work with, it's in, uh, totally undoable because that just brings all their appetite and hunger back and cravings and they feel miserable and then they can't get back on the track. So I, I don't recommend that at all. And we have our, we have our leading um, athletics performance uh, researchers, right? So Dr. Wilson and... Um, oh, oh Dr. Wilson, he's great. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're looking... They're, they've, I saw them present last summer and they talked about like cyclic keto kills your performance it, it doesn't help at all and it only makes things worse so but it's out there people are yeah. going to read about it on the internet they're going to hear it from some trusted sources yeah. and they're going to think that this is the way to go well but and I'm it's appealing you. if you hear like you get to eat lots of carbs on one or two days a week like who wouldn't want to try that <laughs> or you can go you know you can go to a wedding and you know and, and indulge in you know yeah. all of this stuff or you can go through a holiday and indulge in all this stuff but i, I it just it it undermines the commitment that you have to make to it. It's a big commitment, but it's worthwhile commitment. So why do the things that are going to undermine it? Plus, I feel like there's, just it's just personally, it's my own little personal crusade. There's no room in my life for that kind of junk. So, you know, I'm never going to go back to eating grains. There's no room in my life for grains. Yeah. There's no room in my life for sugars. You know, I found all the workarounds that I need to for these things. And if people are going to like, change it up, like, like I said, you know, stage one, um, breast cancer, and now they're done with their therapy, you know, do they have to stay in deep ketosis? I don't think they have to stay in deep ketosis. There's, but, you know, staying with a very low carb um, and at times ketogenic diet is going to benefit them. Yeah. It's going to benefit them in terms of their metabolism for the rest of their life. Yeah. And, you know, I feel better now than I did. And it took my son's, you know, my son's illness to bring me to that point. It just seemed normal to start, you know, the aches and pains. It seemed, you know, normal because that's what happens with older people. Right? You know? Yeah, and, you're told. Yeah. You just yeah. expand in the middle as you get a little older, right, Miriam? That's what you're told. Then your your ankles are right. stiff when you and wake up in the morning. And break per year past yep. pause. It's like, mm, didn't happen. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, so what are some of the, the biggest mistakes that you see people make that are, you know, trying to, like, I'm going to do it on my own. I've got cancer. I'm just going to figure out this keto diet myself. What are some of the biggest mistakes? I'm assuming we've already talked about the protein piece. So I'm sure that's a big one, but. Um, I, I, the, a lot of people can come into this and they don't have an understanding of food quality. And you can get away with that in the beginning because it's not about food quality, shutting down those pathways. It's not about the quality of the food. But in order to improve your health over time and not just stop cancer, um, you should be looking at things like I mentioned earlier about the soybean oil mm. um, or, or other things that people will do. Like I just read a protocol that had flaxseed oil. Well, you know, maybe 10 years ago, people thought yeah. flaxseed oil was okay, but now we know it's not. Yeah. We know we're not going to get our DHA and EPA from, you know, using flaxseed oil. Um, so it's education about um, uh, fats and oils that's really important. Education about the quality of the plant foods that we eat. Education about the quality uh, and the way that the animals are raised that, you know, that we choose to eat. And if we, that's a lifetime learning um, about those things. You know, I'm not there yet. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a lot further along than I was, but I'm still not, you know, not all my choices are perfect in, in, in that. Um, but they don't need to be. You just keep moving forward. You keep getting, you know, more and more educated and, and your um, 
dietary choices become um, better over time. So the, the biggest, the, the problems that I see is, are people falling prey to this whole comfort food idea, mm -hmm. especially when they're in therapy, their neighbors want to bring them something and they're just being too polite. Yeah. So, yeah. so they, they just take that food in and think they have to eat it. And it's like, what I tell people is, listen, you, you know, your friends and your neighbors want to help. So give them a job. Tell them what it is that you need rather than let them flounder around and come up with something that's not going to be helpful to you. Yeah. So yeah. if you need somebody to go shopping for you, ask for that kind of help and give them a shopping list. Yeah. If you need, you know, you need, if somebody you know is going to make you meals, give them a keto recipe. Yeah. Let them make something that's going to work for you. So that, like, like that's one of the, the biggest things is people not, not asking for help or not asking for the right kind of help or accepting things that are undermining their, their efforts. People are, uh, you know, your friends and family, like I said, they can be your best supporters of, or your worst, uh, you know, your worst enemies in this, mm -hmm. but your own thinking can be a problem too. So that inner voice that's telling you this is too hard because you're hearing from other people. Oh, mm -hmm. that's too hard to, it's too limiting. It's too this, it's that. I feel good. You know, am I going to stop taking showers because somebody tells me they're too hard to take? No, because they make me feel good. So, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of things that I'm not going to stop doing based on somebody's opinion that this is too hard or too limiting or too this or that. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to make those uh, judgments based on my own research and my own decisions. And it's not like I, I don't, you know, trust the opinions of doctors, but that's what they are is opinions. Mm, yeah. So I'm still in charge of what goes on in my body. I take it all in. I listen to what people have to say. I don't dismiss things. I don't get confrontational. That's another thing people shouldn't do is get confrontational. There's, there's no need on either side. Like you, you described the, the, um, the uh, social media posting and the, the like, there's oh reaction to is like, but people are used to that. So they see that kind of reaction and they go, well, you know, whatever. Uh, and if they're, if it turns them off to hear that, then maybe they just weren't ready to make the change. That readiness for change, you know that from your background. There has to be a readiness for change. And boy, cancer is a lot more potent than I'm feeling achy in the morning. That's a lot more motivating. Right. So people get that diagnosis. They're ready to buckle down and do something about it. Yes, yeah. Do you also run into the people that say, well, I'm following a keto diet and it's not working um, and, you know, I can't get my ketones up. And what I find often with that is that it's people that, that don't really understand what a ketogenic diet is. They're not doing any kind of measuring. They're not tracking or weighing their food. Right. So it's, it's like, not a keto, like I say, it's not a keto yeah. diet unless you show yeah. me your numbers. Right. You must you're in ketosis. Like I, well, I sell, how do you know you're in ketosis? Yeah. Well, I'm eating this and I'm doing that. And I go, no, 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 no. Yeah. You have to have an objective measure. Right. You have to be able to see the strip, you know, and you have to be able to see this, that, that you're making ketones. Otherwise, you know, you know, you may not be in ketosis. The other thing that is sometimes you brought that up is a good point. Uh, sometimes people will be testing their blood glucose levels mm -hmm. and they might be, you know, testing 45 minutes after a meal. It's like, okay, <laughs> you're going to see a change 45 minutes after any meal. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, I, get, I get that all the time. They're like, it was this number in the morning and then it was this number in the afternoon and then this number in the evening, like it's all different. What? And it's like, yeah, it's going to be different. <laughs> what you want, and that's what I tell people, I want to see, it's not like I want to, you know, that your numbers have to be 55 for glucose. That's not realistic for adults. That's great goal for kids, yeah. but it's not a great goal for adults. And the older we get with each decade, you got to tag on a few more milligrams per deciliter that people are going to, you know, see. But the goal isn't to get it to, to, you know, to be 55. The goal is to keep those insulin spikes from happening. Yeah. It's the insulin spikes that, and the glucose spikes and the insulin spikes and the damage that they do multiple times a day multiple times a day. Yeah. You know, I, sh I have this in my book, I have this uh, um, uh, picture, it's a graph and it shows, um, you know, it shows the spikes for three meals a day, but how many of us are spiking our glucose six or seven or eight times a day? Right. The choice of snacks and things that we're eating in between meals or at bedtime. So um, keeping it low and steady is the goal that letting 
glucose homeostasis, you know, it's a big word, but come instead of to come from, okay, the glucose is spiked up and the insulin's going to, you know, instead of having it happen that way, your liver's going to do it. And your liver's going to, you know, it's going to be much more reasonable and kind of, it's only going to make the glucose that it needs, you know, unless you're taking in too much protein and then it's going to yeah. make excess glucose more than you need. Yeah. Well, and, um, oh man, that was all, uh, oh, oh, I know. I was like, wait, there was something I was asking, but I was too involved in just listening to what you were saying. Um, so you mentioned too, so a lot of times, um, you know, and some people know this and some people don't that they'll, you know, to measure ketosis, we want to check blood ketones. Um, oh, we just had a light, uh, a power flash there here. So hopefully, <laughs> um, that, um, you know, that you're in ketones for people just trying to follow a ketogenic guide is, you know, for most reasons, um, that, you know, they're going to taper off in the urine over time. And so, you know, don't, don't worry about your lip, your, your urine ketones long-term, but you were saying you've got, you know, figured out that how that can actually be really helpful, especially for treating cancer. So can you share your perspective sure. uh, on I, that? I, and when people are doing a ketogenic diet for cancer, they're generally aiming for, ke they're looking at ketone levels. And if they're using, even occasionally just using um, a, a blood testing to see where their levels are at, they get a pretty good idea over time mm -hmm. what, where their levels are at. And then the, what the keto, the urine ketone sticks are still going to show, um, they're still going to show ketones. The problem with the, the more recent problem with urine ketone strips is with the introduction of all the exogenous ketone and exogenous ketone. I don't know how, how much, um, you know, the, your audience here knows about them, but those are the ketone salts and eventually there'll be some ketone esters as well. Um, you know, we can think of MCT as being MCT oil as being um, a food source for ketones, but exogenous ketones are things that you take in as a supplement, usually as a powder um, stirred into water, uh, and it boosts your ketone levels and it boosts urine ketone levels too. So you can delude yourself into thinking you're in strong ketosis uh, on the basis of that, but you still got to, you know, you got to occasionally do the, the, um, finger prick test as well as a backup. And I know people who have been following this long term can use the ketonics breath meter and get a good correlation from that. But you gotta, you've got to have biohacked enough to know what the, that correlation is. Um, I don't recommend that people start out using that tool. Okay. But uh, the thing that I like, especially in the beginning, in the first few months with the urine, stri urine strips, and they got to be a good they got to be not the generic brands. They got to be name brand. Okay. Um, and what those are good for is to tell you if you screwed up in the last couple of hours. So if you okay. messed up and, you know, you went out to, you know, you went out to dinner and, you know, you had balsamic vinaigrette or something, it may have had more sugar in it than you anticipated. Now you get home and the urine strip isn't showing anything. You just have to look back in the last couple of hours and what did you do in those couple of hours mm. that might have changed that. So, um, so they're a good measure of, you know, your voluntary compliance. The other thing that they help to do is um, they kind of, they, they boost that compliance and accountability mm. because if you're thinking and people are about the next time you pee on the strip and what it's going to look like, you know, are you going to take that bite of something that might interfere with that? So if you're checking like that, with an inexpensive measure like that to, you know, an inexpensive way to check for ketosis, you're less likely to do those kinds of, those, those kinds of non-compliant things. And if you're recording what you're eating and you're doing it, not kidding yourself about what you're doing, uh, you're going to think twice before you take, you know, that piece of bread at dinner. Yeah. You yeah. have to write it down and then you're not going to like looking at that because it's going to correlate with a drop in your, a rise in your, in your blood glucose and a drop in your ketones. So those are all their, their tools to help people understand how their bodies are working, but also their tools for, for compliance and accountability. Yeah. Yeah. Tools and accountability are, are great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Miriam, what, uh, what would you um, recommend for somebody, um, anybody who's watching this who's newly diagnosed with cancer, or maybe they've got some kind of cancer going on that they're just hearing about a ketogenic diet for the first time for that. What, wh where do you recommend that they start? What do they, what do they do first? You know, um, there's, you know, I have a book on, I have a book, an ebook on my website. Okay. Um, and, um, but I have a 
book that's coming out in print. And that book is going to be out by Chelsea Green Publishing. And it's going to be in October. It's going to be October, October 2017. Okay. Uh -huh. So it's all written. It's to the, you know, it's to the publisher. Now it just has to go through the process. So tell us, tell us your, your website. We'll also link it below in the show notes. Okay. What, it's diet dietarytherapies.com. Okay. And so you, they can get your ebook right now on there. And then um, October 17th or later than they, they can pre order that through Amazon. And that for, um, for people with uh, that understand ketogenic um, and practitioners who are looking to, to get up to speed with how to do this for cancer. Um, my, that's, that's what my book is geared towards. Nice. So okay. uh, it, it's, it's not an intro, although it can be used that way, but it's not designed to be an intro. It's a pretty extensive, comprehensive guide to a ketogenic diet for cancer. Um, so, uh, but in the meantime, for people who are diagnosed right now, they can't wait till October to get that. And uh, Ellen Davis has a website, Ketogenic Diet Resource, and uh, she has a book on her website that is a very good um, intro guide to the diet. She has some information on her website, too. It's vetted, good information on her website. And she has a, a book that uh, you can order through Amazon or you can get from her website in a, uh, in a, like a Kindle format. Uh, I'm not right. sure how she delivers it. Okay. Yeah, but, great, uh, great. Those, are, those are the best resources. And then um, uh, there's Keto Diet App. And they have 60 amazing fat bombs. Those are ways that people can incorporate more fat into their meals. Um, and then uh, Ruled Me has a bunch of keto recipes. With all keto recipes that you find online, you need to look at, um, at the protein and make sure that the protein is not above your target. You may have to wean it off a little bit. And then if you want a good cookbook, um, uh, Patricia Daly's cookbook, her, it's actually she wrote it with Dominique Kemp, but it's Patricia Daly's meal plan and recipes that work for keto for cancer. And that's called okay. ketogenic kitchen. And that's okay. available on Amazon too. And I, I, I gotta think you want people working with a qualified healthcare practitioner with this as well, right? Yeah. It's, it's best if they can, there's very few of us out there and I'm not working with new clients right now. Um, but uh, Charlie foundation, um, if you go online to charliefoundation.org, uh, there's a link to ketogenic diet specialists yeah. Not all of them have um, ex uh, in interest in cancer. Um, there's, a, there's a few, and I don't want to just tick names off. So yeah. people can write to me, and I will do an introduction to them. And I think that's kind of helpful to go through me and that. There's nothing in it for me to do that, yeah. um, except I get to look at that, and then I go, hmm, this would be good, well-suited here, 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 or maybe they should be working here. There's a few integrative oncologists out there coming from naturopathic or, or, or um, integrative medicine backgrounds. And if I, if, you know, if I look at some, what somebody writes me, I can direct them towards one of those people as well. Yeah, fantastic. And I want to mention another book too. It's called yeah. Tripping Over the Truth. And Travis Christofferson wrote it. And, um, you know, Dr. Seyfried's book is, of course, the, the, you know, the cornerstone of all of this, Cancer is a Metabolic Disease. Um, but it's a tough read for somebody starting out without a lot of background in, in biochem or, yeah. or just biology. Um, but Travis's book reads like a novel and oh, okay. it introduces all the characters, tells us how we got where we are with our thinking on you know, cancer genetics. Um, and it's very readable. And that's, I think that's a good place to start in understanding why a ketogenic diet or why any metabolic therapeutics um, are a good, at least a good adjunct, even if you're not using them exclusively. Fantastic. Mm. And so just as we wrap this up now, is there anything else that you were hoping I would ask you about or anything else that you think is really Check important? Cheat sheet over here. And see. <laughs> ah, yeah, there is something. Um, on your website, I saw all of the positive side effects of, um, of you know, ketogenic diet, being in ketosis. And, and, and they are just, uh, you know, it's a wonderful list. Uh, I ask people to sort of temper that, uh, that and expect that after they're done with their treatment because treatment, mm -hmm. conventional cancer care, which is chemotherapy and radiation, uh, wreaks havoc with the digestive system and it wreaks havoc with the immune system and sleep, um, energy. So a lot of times people will say, uh, will say to me, oh, you know, they, 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 they just feel like dead in the afternoon. 
and they think it has something to do with diet. Yeah. And, you know, here they're like five days out from a chemotherapy infusion. So, uh, so part of what I do is kind of bring people back to the reality of what these treatments are doing. But it does get better. So even if you don't have, it's the opposite with, you know, it's like people don't have appetite when they're in chemotherapy. They're, they're, right. Their absorption is really poor. And they just, you know, that's one of the reasons they really need to be working with somebody, I think. You can do the diet by yourself because diet is a choice. But if you work with somebody, you can get past some of these uh, issues and on to these wonderful side effects a lot faster. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. There's a lot of different approach that, you know, I'm working with people that are trying to lose weight and, you know, overeating is a problem for them. Whereas a lot of people, especially if they're doing chemo and radiation, they're not having an appetite oh, they're, and they're, and weight loss. And they're doctors prime fear coming into a ketogenic diet because they've read about, you know, Kim Kardashian's marvelous weight loss. Uh, it, you know, they're worried that their uh, patients are going to lose too much weight because yeah. that's what happens with, with traditional care, with conventional care, people lose weight and mm -hmm. it's unintentional weight loss. Um, but, uh, you know, that's another thing I make really clear, like in my book too, there's a big difference between unintended weight loss and, and what you're, what you're doing with switching your, your diet to make it therapeutic. So this is a therapeutic way of eating. And, you know, so when people say to me, how long do I have to do this for? It's like, well, how long do you want to feel good? You know? <laughs> yeah. So if you only want to feel good for a couple of months, just do it for a couple of months. But if you want to feel good, yeah. you're going to want to make this your lifestyle. And you're going to want to make these other changes. You want to, you know, improve your sleep and you want to lower your stress and you want to remove the toxins from your environment and you want to be physically active. That's huge. Physical activity for people who are feeling tired is sometimes the best way to go, but you just can't push it beyond your, um, your limits, really your personal limits while you're in therapy. So it all gets better once you get past the therapy part and you get to the healing part of it. Uh, yeah. And for people who um, are like cancer survivors and are, and are, you know, thinking along the lines of, well, what can I, what can I do to clean it up? Um, you know, what the work that you're doing and the work that I'm doing is the perfect route to go down. It's the perfect path. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. I just, my final question for you is that, uh, let's say you find out the, the news today says the asteroids come into the planet. Um, we're all, it's, this is our last day on this planet. What, What's going to be your fi final meal? My final meal. Oh, you're funny. <laughs> uh, my final meal will be a no meal. Oh. I, would, I will not eat. If this was my last day on earth and I ask, you don't know this about me, but this is a question I ask myself when I get too into my head. Okay. I'm on a walk and yeah. I'm supposed to be enjoying being out on this beautiful walk uh, in the mountains that are just in my backyard. Yeah. And I'll go, if this was my last day on earth, would I be worrying about this issue or would I be thinking about my deadline on that? Or, you know, no, I would just be like, so into, so that's what I would want to do. It's like, Oh, heck with a meal. I just want to be out there and enjoy being out in nature right now. And I want to see that asteroid as it's coming. Wow. That's fantastic. You're the only person that's answered it like that. And I love that. That's just mindfulness. Like just, I want to be in this moment and, and enjoy everything about this and, Food is a distraction. Yeah, food is a distraction. I want, to, I want to take this moment in as my last moment. I, I constantly marvel at the improbability of my own existence here on earth and the improbability of all of, this, the, all of the, the tiny little events that have put me here today. I mean, going back to that one, I mean, this is just a really powerful one to bring back into focus was science daily. You know, science daily. I'm on it one day and it's got something to do with a cancer drug and I'm going to print it out. Can't. So I'm back on it four days later and there's Dr. Seafried's research just at the same time. They're kicking my kid off of his, off of his this last chance clinical trial. Wow. What an, what an amazing story. Uh, Miriam, thank you so much for being here with me. I so appreciate it. And um, I'm so glad that you're out there doing the work that you're doing and thank you for the book that's coming. I know it's going to change so many lives and I just look forward to everything that's in your future that you're going to give to this planet and all the people here. So thank, thank you. you. And so I thank you for your, for your work. And when people contact me that 
are not looking for keto for cancer, uh, it's wonderful to have uh, such a supportive resource as what you offer people. That that um, that one to one contact with people is so important, especially in those first few weeks. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. So everybody watching, uh, give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video. If you want to see more, subscribe down below. Um, check out the notes below too. We'll have a lot of links to the books that Miriam has mentioned, the websites. We'll have all of that there. Um, and that's all for now. But thank you everyone for watching. Bye now. Mm -hmm.